Welcome to our lecture on the Battle of Passchendaele. Now before we get into it, just a discussion about the title of the Battle of Passchendaele. So in some textbooks you see this battle, which lasts from July to November 1917, as the Third Battle of Ypres, and it does take place around Ypres, whereas some textbooks call the Battle of Passchendaele is one of the smaller battles that are part of the broader battle, the Third Battle of Ypres. There's also a phase of battle that takes place before July on the Messine Ridge. Now we're going to talk about all of that today because it's all connected into the battle um, that we want to study. But what we are going to study, just so you're, you're clear, is we are going to study the full series of battles that take place in the area around Ypres from, um, uh, during 1917. And in our syllabus, it's referred to as Passchendaele. And so that's how I will refer to it from this point in time. But just so that you know, if you see it in some textbooks, that uh, it can also be referred to as the Third Battle of Ypres. So the set of notes we're looking at is this Battle of Passchendaele set of notes. And we're actually all the way now through to the second page. Uh, and we're going to start talking about the goals of these 1917 offences. Now, as you may recall, we've talked about the French mutiny and the pressure that it put on. Now, while the mutiny itself was really brought under control without any serious damage, what it did do was force the French to decide not to undertake any more offensives. And uh, that meant that this was uh, now over to the British to take any initiative during 1917. Now Haig, uh, who of course is the commander of the British, decided that it was imperative, absolutely essential, to undertake an offensive in the area around Ypres. Here's Ypres, which had already been under battle in um, two times, so this would be the third battle of Ypres. And the main idea here is that there is an attempt to make a break through the line so that the Allied troops could move through the area and then up to the north to the ports that were up there of Ostend and Zeebrugge, which is just, just to the north there of Ostend. Now, these port areas were very important, and the Allies wanted to uh, Allies wanted to gain control of them. As you can see at this point, they're behind German lines, and this is because of the U-boat campaign that was taking place. So German U-boats, submarines or U-boats, which is underwater under underboats, uh, were being used very very successfully by the Germans during uh, the World War One, and what they were using them for was to actually blockade ships from getting into Britain. So if we have a look here at this, so here we go, okay, Ostend and Zeebrugge were here. Ostend and Zeebrugge here are actually just here on this map of, that shows us the North Sea. And while we have Britain here, Germany all the way over here, so a lot of the, the German U-boats were situated here near Kiel, um, but the Germans had put in these ports, using the ports of Ostend and Zeebrugge as for their U-boats. And this gave them a fantastic position from which they could then patrol the English Channel and out into the Atlantic, uh, attempting to uh, sink any shipping, any trade that was attempting to make its way to Great Britain. Uh, and this was being very effective in blockading uh, goods and supplies from getting into Britain. In fact, it was having such an impact that uh, there was a possibility of Britain starting to run out of you know, things like flour, for example. And it could have um, pushed Britain all the way out of the war in late 1917 if something hadn't been done. Therefore, this is why Haig gets the go-ahead for an offensive in the Flanders area, that's the, the name of the large area 
here in Belgium. So to achieve a breakthrough and be able to secure the naval bases of Ostend and Zeebrugge. The start of the offensive is sometimes called part of the Third Battle of Ypres and sometimes separate, but we need to take a look at it because these opening offensives in June are key to undertaking uh, the later offensives um, that are moving towards the village of Passchendaele. So on this map here, the grey is actually a ridge line, so a higher position. And as you can see, if we're looking here at this line, June 1917, uh, certainly along here the Germans are holding the high ground along this ridge. Now from this ridge, the Germans have control over all of this area. And if the British are trying to move through here, move through this area, take the village of Passchendaele and create a breakthrough so they can go up to the ports, it's essential to basically remove the Germans from this high ridge line before they can undertake that battle successfully. And so this area, which is called the Messine Ridge, is the town of Messine here, uh, it is a, an offensive which is undertaken in June 1917. One of the massive techniques used um, all the way along the ridge line here was underground explosives put in place by the different tunnelling companies. And here we've got a picture of the first Australian engineers. So you might recall the movie Beneath Hill 60. Well, this is the real tunnelling company. And Hill 60 is one of the hills on this Messine Ridge Line. This picture here gives you an idea of the size of the crater that's been blown apart after the explosion. Uh, you can see here nothing but mud really is left. Uh, and just for your interest, I've got here a picture of Edward Woodward, uh, Oliver Woodward, sorry, who was the lieutenant featured in the uh, film. So the, the film is Beneath Hill 60 is based on a real person, uh, and this was him. To give you an idea, Hill 60 today is still a massive crater. This is Hill 60 today, uh, and you can see that's the, the, the edge there. So it's just this massive hole has been blown up, uh, leaving just behind a, a crater, uh, which is still today filled with water. And there is actually a memorial to the first, uh, the Australian First Engineers um, Tunnelling Company uh, near Hill 60 today. The other thing that they're using, and I, I like this um, shot because it shows us yet another a uh, type of, of weapon. It's called the Livens Projector. It's essentially a line of trench mortars, but what they're delivering here, you can see here a canister of gas. Um, being put in here uh, and this line of mortars was actually you can see the cables so they were actually cabled up together so that one trigger could set off a whole line of, uh, um, of these mortars projecting the gas into the opposition's trenches. Now the uh, attempt to take the Messine Ridge is highly successful uh, so as all of those mines are blown up in succession about 10,000 Germans were killed or buried alive um, in those few minutes that it takes for the detonations to go off. About 7,500 Germans were actually taken prisoner as the follow-up infantry attack uh, moments after the explosions had finished. And we can see here from a, uh, a magazine from 1917, this is a drawing, but it's depicting this um, taking into custody of these more than 7,000 German prisoners of war. And even here you can see that they're commenting on the explosion of mines on the ridge and the terrific bombardment which attended the assault. So the infantry used bite and hold tactics as they went in to Messine after the uh, explosions had taken place. And the Germans didn't really uh, un undertake a counterattack at this point, but instead fell back. And this was a, the successful completion of that mission, really. You can see here how far the line moved after the 7th of June. It's pushed all the way back here 
as the Germans just fell back into defensive, new defense, defensive positions. Now, you might say, okay, very successful, let's go, let's go. What's the, the, the next uh, point that we're going to make? But Haig actually felt that it, it, uh, there needed to be time to bring more equipment and logistics into the area before he could launch the successful Passchendaele component further north here. So he's wanting to move forward from the line through this area now. And so even though the Messine Ridge um, offensive is very successful, Haig doesn't start the next phase of the offensive straight away. Unfortunately, what that does is it allows the Germans time to know that there is an offensive coming and they built more um, secure defences, uh, reinforced their defences with extra concrete uh, and more pillboxes were built in this very short time. Um, in some areas, the, the line was actually built nine layers deep with lots of reserves ready to defend the line because they understood what was coming. So it's 18th of July before we start the next phase and it commences with heavy artillery bombardment. Uh, and uh, this picture here just uh, again shows you some of the artillery being moved again by horse into the area um, and uh, coming in ready to take positions in order to start this July artillery bombardment. Now one of the things we need to know about this flatland area here around Ypres is that it used to be a swampland and uh, the swampland had been reclaimed by the Belgians in this area and turned into farmland by building a, a drainage system under the soil in order to drain away the water to be able to use it more effectively for farmland. What you've got to understand, however, is that if you are bombarding an area constantly, um, with these artillery shells exploding the earth and churning it up, you're going to destroy the drainage system which has been put into place. And to make matters worse, in July 1917, there are very, very heavy thunderstorms and a lot of rain in the area. And so what we are seeing across this area here is very quickly the fields are turning into mud. The first phase of the offensive, the infantry offensive, is now launched on the 31st of August. And I just want to show you in your notes, there's actually a mistake. We can see here the first phase of the offensive. It's not the 31st of August as it has in your notes. It's actually the 31st of July that the infantry attack comes in. There were French troops involved in this offensive, but it is British-led and it is mostly British that go into battle, including, of course, Canadians, Australians, and New Zealanders. Haig again is looking for his breakthrough, but he's not going to get it. This time, however, he is adapted to the new techniques, and they're using not only bite and hold, but leapfrog tactics, um, which uh, allow for more refreshed troops to keep move, moving forward at different times. The British were able to secure the front line of German trenches after just three days, but couldn't get the breakthrough that Haig had initially planned for them. Um, and we, we've already talked about the, uh, the German defences had actually been built stronger during this time. So while we're getting the Germans pushed back, um, there's certainly no breakthrough. On the first day alone of the Battle of Passchendaele, there are 32,000 Allied casualties. And these kinds of pictures give us a view of the conditions taking place on the battlefield in those first weeks of the Battle of Passchendaele. And this is the mud of Passchendaele, even worse than the mud that had been experienced at the Somme. You can see here these stretcher bearers in, down to their knees and uh, these soldiers here having to carry duck boards with them to create pathways across the mud. So this is, ends this part of the mini lecture. We'll come back and look a little bit more at the conditions of the Battle of Passchendaele.